Yeah, hello everyone and welcome to the Artificial Intelligence track at FMX 2023 and we are now in our third talk on uh, artificial intelligence. We have uh, Dave uh, McKean here uh, who, is in, um, who has illustrated and designed over 80 award-winning um, yeah, uh, books and um, uh, graphic novels and Dave has uh, directed also five um, uh, yeah, short, mo short films and three um, feature films uh, like uh, Mirror Mask, Luna and uh, The Gospel of Us. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, currently he is editing um, his fourth feature film and uh, he's here today to talk uh, about AI, about the, the influence of AI probably for the creative industry. But with that, um, I will give the words to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Thanks very much for coming along to this. So this was really a case of a very nice person saying, do you want to come along to FMX and talk about your adventures in artificial intelligence? And I, my guard was down, so I said, yeah, OK. And now I'm here. I, I don't really know who you are or what FMX is. but. Um, I have a go. I've done this book called Prompt Conversations with Artificial Intelligence. That's what's prompted uh, this. But I, I'm, I'm not, I don't do artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I've been working 30 odd years now. Essentially, I don't represent a company or an agency or a union or anything or an industry, really. I'm just an individual human being. Uh, trying to make sense, work out what the hell's going on, mostly by making marks on paper, join them, joining them together to tell stories. I'm basically a storyteller. And I've been working 30 odd years doing that in a sort of prelapsarian world of physical objects and books. So I don't want you to go away from this and tell your friends, we went to see this AI bloke talk about that. I'm not an AI bloke. And I want to, first of all, make sure that you realise I've been doing, you know, working in other things for a long time. So I'm going to hold the AI back for as long as I possibly can by showing you what I do in my real life, my real work, uh, if it works. And it won't work. Fantastic. That's a good start, isn't it? Space bar? Space bar? Oh, no. I can't, I can't, it won't work. This is technology laughing at me. It's supposed to just do that. No, you see, I can't do that because that's, that's see, you're giving the game away now. I've got to do it one step at a time. There, it works. Fantastic. Um, so uh, this has coincided with um, a sort of retrospective book that I've been putting together. Um, and these are the covers for it. And I've, so I've been forced to look back over my work, such that it is, and try and make sense of it. Um, again, these are the covers. Uh, and I've been making books. Um, films, illustrations, music, writing uh, for a long time. But I started making comic books. Uh, comics were my first love. Comics got me reading. Like a lot of boys, I was a bad reader. Uh, but I discovered comic books when I was eight years old. Uh, and I loved the medium. And then when I was in art school, I met this uh, struggling journalist called Neil Gaiman. Um, I had no idea what happened to him. Uh, and th this is our first book together called Violent Cases. And then we started working a little bit uh, for DC Comics in New York. Uh, this is a Batman book. It's my one and only adventure in superhero land. A story I never really understood. Um, uh, you know, so Bruce Wayne, as a, as a little boy, sees his parents gunned down in front of him. And obviously, this has a traumatic effect on him. And so he decides, as an as a, as a older, successful man, I've got lots of money, I can now make a difference to the world. And then you turn the page and he's dressed as a bat. Um, I, there are pages missing, surely, in this story. Um, and then for DC also, Neil started writing the series called Sandman, which you may have heard of. It was a television show recently. And I did all the design, all the covers, worked on the design of the characters. Um, and the point of these covers really was to reach out to an audience who didn't normally buy comics. 
we wanted them as well, but we wanted people who were buying novels and going to see films. So I was trying to speak to them in a vernacular that they could recognise. Um, the first book that I wrote is called Cages. And, you know, a lot of comic books are filled with people gesticulating madly and talking in strange prose. And the subtlety of human interaction is often missing, and I wanted to bring that back into comics. And Cages is about art and belief and all the things I was interested in at the time, but very much about the human experience. The thing I love about comics is it's a very intimate form. Uh, it's, it's often used to tell big adventure stories with lots of explosions and... But actually, it's very intimate. It's a, it's a whispering voice in your head as you turn the pages. Um, but it doesn't have the cold text of a novel. You turn the page and these, these images flood into your head. It's very much like music in that sense. It goes straight in. So as a medium, I think it's a fantastically powerful tool. Um, I've continued to make comics in every kind of form. Drawings, abstraction, um, uh, whatever is appropriate for the story, really. This is a project called Black Dog, The Dreams of Paul Nash. It was a commissioned by the 1418 Now Foundation, who commissioned all the First World War memorial work in England. Um, every year for four years, they commissioned 20-odd artworks across every medium, and they wanted to do a graphic novel. I wanted to look at the war through one person's eyes. Paul Nash was our greatest war artist, and I tried to tell it as a sequence of dreams, each one in a style that I hope is appropriate for the events that I'm talking about going back to his childhood, growing up, and then finding his voice in the trenches. This is his wedding uh, that took place as the first Zeppelins went over London. Um, and then the idea for the piece was also to have a performance aspect to it. So I've always played music. Um, I had a great time at the Sydney Opera House putting a piece of work together called Nine Lives. So this was what we did with uh, Black Dog. I wrote an orchestral piece of an hour uh, weaving in a song cycle, telling the story. Uh, the images in the book were uh, uh, projected as animatics. And we performed at the Tate Gallery in London and at the Somme Memorial and the Holocaust Museum and various festivals across Canada and Europe and India. A project I'm really proud of. Uh, most recent graphic novel is this one, Raptor. Uh, it's a, it was a way of being able to talk about the politics that we're living through at the moment, but from an allegorical angle, so it's not so direct. Uh, it's also inspired by nature writing. There's a, a wonderful strain of nature writing at the moment that is deeply political, but also very, very beautiful, re recovering the language. So that's been a big inspiration for this piece. Um, I've done a lot of children's books. I had children, so I thought it would be nice if we could work on some things together and I could do some books for them. This is Coraline. Again, you may know it. It was a film, uh, but I illustrated it originally for Neil. I've done a lot of books with David Almond. This is The Savage. Wonderful, very dark English writer. His books come from a very dark place, often in involving loss. Um, this was a project with the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Um, I admired his writing. He always talked in interviews about wanting to do something that was an introduction to critical thinking and science. But the book never seemed to happen, so I got uh, my agent to get in touch with his agent, and it, in the end, he had one little idea, which was to ask a series of questions of the world. They're over there. What is an earthquake? What is the sun? Uh, what is reality? What is magic? What, what is a rainbow? And then each chapter would answer those questions in the ways that we have in the past through myth and theology. And then the second part of each chapter would be our very best scientific explanation. That seemed to be a nice structure. Uh, most recent children's book, Tiger, uh, with SF Said, who I've done a few books with. He takes seven years to write every book, so it's a, you, know, you have to hang around for his books. And I've carried on working with, uh, you know, a lot of the same writers illustrating many books. This is American Gods for Neil. Um, a project with John Cale, who was in Velvet Underground with Lou Reed. This was his autobiography, including a version on loose pages that comes like a box of typewriter paper, you know, so you can just rearrange his life in any order you fancy. I always like that idea. 
Uh, a few books with Stephen King. Um, I'm not a big horror fan, but his observations of life where he lives in Maine, America, are really beautiful. That's the stuff I love about his books. Uh, this is uh, the Gorman Gas Trilogy by Mervyn Peake. 150 drawings for this. This was a long piece. Uh, set in a labyrinthine castle in a kind of uh, alternate medieval England. It's a political satire, but the labyrinth of the castle is sort of mirrored in the drawings. The negative space becomes the labyrinth. Um, I've done a lot of work with a great chef called Heston Blumenthal, three-star Michelin chef. Um, and what Heston tries to do is work narrative into his dinner, really. So you go along, and the, the menu is a map, and he takes you on a journey. And what he's trying to do is trigger those memories that you had as a kid, those primal taste memories of getting an ice cream from the ice cream man, or going on holiday by the beach, and the saltiness of the air and the fishiness of the fish. He's a bit of a magician. My favorite dish that Heston serves is a little cup of grey tea. It doesn't really look much at all. And it comes along. I watched other people get this thing when I went to the restaurant for the first time. And the, the look of astonishment on their faces. I thought, what the hell is it? Um, and what it is is hot and cold tea, but vertically in the glass. There's no divider at all. The left half of the liquid stays hot and the right half stays cold. And you drink it and your mouth is hot. You don't look impressed by this. This is pure magic. I mean, he should be burnt at the stake, I think, for that. Um, I work with a great London writer called Ian Sinclair. This is our, our latest couple of books together, Agents of Oblivion and uh, 50 Catacomb Saints. Ian works on many levels. All of his books occupy levels of London, mythic London, London of the past, London of the future. And I still working occasionally in galleries. These are a series of paintings inspired by silent cinema. It's an era that I really love. In fact, I like the beginnings of most things. A lot of the things that I love started at the beginning of the 20th century, jazz, comics, movies. And you can see the language being created. Arguably, we're kind of living through a similar era now with digital tools. We're coming to terms with what that language is. Um, so these are some paintings inspired by silent films that got under my skin when I was very young. Those images, those um, dusty black and white flickering images that I couldn't really understand as a, as a very young person. I didn't know films were that old. And I loved those images and they got in, into my bloodstream. So I've been making these paintings and drawings to kind of understand why I love them so much, really. These are some of the drawings. Napoleon. Um, and then this is another book I'm doing at the moment, uh, a conversational book with a Spanish artist, Jorge Gonzalez. Um, I, I start and send him a piece, and then he responds and sends it back. It's a kind of chess game. Um, I've always wanted to do this. It's inspired by Milton Glaser, a great American teacher who did a book with Jean-Michel Follon called Conversations, my favorite thing that he did. And Jorge was the first person I talked to about it who came to play with me. Um, and I continue to do a, a sort of exhibitions, but I only really enjoy doing it when there's a narrative involved. So I tend to tell stories in the gallery. I see I've been given the moniker in the list of guests of artist, which I, I'm not an artist. I try to avoid being called an artist. Um, narrative is very out of favor in the art world at the moment, and I think it's crucial to our sense of ourselves. Uh, but these narrative stories I've really enjoyed doing because people tend to come to the space, realize there's a story going on, and stay, and get to play with the story. This was called Blue Tree, and as well as the gallery, I, in the town, at five o'clock in the morning before the show opened, I planted blue trees everywhere. So everybody woke up in the town, and there were these blue trees everywhere, pointing up to the gallery. Um, this is uh, called The Rut, which was in uh, the Pump House in London. It involved uh, starting with comics to bring you into the gallery space, but then the story split off into multiple directions. So the truth was in the room somewhere, but it was down to you to decide where the truth was. 
And uh, you can just about see there were masks on poles uh, in the middle of the room and a strange object with type distorted on it. And if you looked in, put your head into the mask, uh, the type came together and you could read it. But then there were three masks, so you could go round to another mask and the type would reform in a different way. But then, of course, you're wearing the mask, so everybody else in the room sees you as the main character because you're wearing the mask. I had a lot of fun with this. Um, and then I've done a lot of album covers and music-related things over the years. Music's really important for me. Um, Fear Factory, I'll just rattle through some of these. Dream Theatre. John Cale again. Uh, a lot of work for Bill Bruford, great drummer, King Crimson, good friend of mine. Matthew Sharp is my cellist for Black Dog, his performance of Hans Gahl. Uh, this was, as far as I know, the first narrative online um, serialised piece of work. If anybody knows better, please tell me. I've been telling everybody it was the first one. I'm happy for it not to be. I don't really care. But it was called Club Salsa, done a long time ago. Um, and then films, finally. Um, I've done uh, a fair, fair bit of film work. It's not my primary thing, but I kind of dip in and out. I designed some of the Harry Potter stuff. Um, and then I did this recently. Do you remember this film, Caligula? Anybody remember Caligula? Terrible, wasn't it? Awful. Terrible film. With an amazing cast. Malcolm McDowell, Peter O'Toole, Helen Mirren, John Gielgud. So a friend of mine has found themselves in possession of all 90 hours of rushes for this film. And, uh, and, and, he, and he got the rushes about three weeks before it was due to be sent to landfill. It would have been destroyed. So he's been recutting it, uh, going back to Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal wrote it, going back to Gore Vidal's original script. And um, he got halfway through recutting it and realised... He hadn't used a single frame from the original film and managed to get the, all the way through the whole film. There isn't a single frame from the original cut of the film. Their choices were so bad. Uh, you know, when, the, when there was a choice between two shots and one of them was out of focus, they went with that one. Um, anyway, the one scene that was never shot by Tinto Brass. T Tinto Brass, the director, the writer, the composer, the editor, all uh, were not uh, credited <laughs> in the film because they all either walked off in disgust or were fired. Um, the only film I know that suffered that. Anyway, uh, Tinto Brass never shot the dream sequence at the beginning, so I've done that as a kind of um, semi-animatic animation piece, something that would be appropriate for, the, for 1979, so pre-digital. So that's a recent one. I've made a few films. These are some short films. The week before was um, a little film I made about, with a, with, with a tiny budget, I, I, fi I financed it. Uh, two actors, one set, so it, obviously it's small. So um, it's about God creating everything in the universe. But it's the week before God creates everything in the universe, so it's the week when God shows up with the best intention of creating everything in the universe. But can't really think of anything and puts it off. And so it's about trying to create things from scratch. Uh, Neon is, an old, is a strange sort of melancholy ghost story. That got me noticed by Lisa Henson. So uh, Neil and I made Mirror Mask, which was some live action, but a lot of animation and again, a tiny budget. So it involved putting a studio together of art students, really, fresh out of art school, never done anything, never done a job, let alone a film before. Uh, 17 art students, and I divided up the film into chapters, and I gave each one a whole chapter to do, and they were fantastic. They really rose to the challenge and did a lovely job for me. A um, little bit of live-action footage in the middle, lots of CG. Uh, second film was called Luna, uh, which I'm happier with, really. It's a more serious film. It's about the loss of a child. Um, and then this odd piece with Michael Sheen called The Gospel of Us, um, which I'll very quickly rattle through. Oh, no, I won't. I haven't got any stills from it. Uh, it was a three-day live uh, theatrical piece uh, that happened in Port Talbot in Wales, Michael Sheen's hometown, telling the Easter story, but as a secular event. And it started with an old 97-year-old man standing up, singing a call to prayer 
to an audience of about four people and a dog and me and my camera. Uh, by midday, a couple of thousand people had shown up to see what was happening. By the end of the three days, 20,000 people had shown up to see Michael Sheen get crucified on a roundabout in Port Talbot. A very strange experience, a bit of a life-changing experience for lots of people. The whole community, a thousand people from the community were involved. Theatrical groups, bands, Manic Street preachers showed up. Um, and uh, it was, yeah, an extraordinary event. Um, films with Ian Sinclair, The Falconer and the Asylum. And then this is the piece that I'm working on at the moment, which was uh, a theatre piece again for um, Bill Mitchell's uh, Wild Works. Um, I sh I've been shooting it. I shot the uh, performances as they were happening, and I'm slowly cutting it together. Thank you. That's better. Um, and uh, what happened was an audience would arrive at 7 o'clock, and we'd take them for a walk through the woods and show them this strange slightly fantastical allegorical story about the animal nature inside us and the often strained relationship, strained, strained relationship between mothers and their daughters. Anyway, so ordinarily my talk would end there and uh, I'd be happy about that. Um, but while I was illustrating this book by the Strugatsky brothers, Roadside Picnic, um, which was paintings and drawings. Um, I was invited to try uh, an artificial intelligence thing online. In fact, what happened was I started to see images on my Facebook feed from friend, illustrator friends of mine, and I couldn't quite see what they were, really. So I did about 10 minutes research on what mid-journey was and what artificial intelligence image creation was. Um, and then I spent a day in a fetal position on the floor of my studio. Uh, and, and then I, I, there, was a, there was a very sort of cheap, rough and ready one called Night Cafe that's free. So I tried that. So I tried to get, I fed lines from Roadside Picnic into the, into the bot. And it spat out a few raw materials for me. This is an edit of about seven images. So I found it quite hard work to get anything out of it that I liked in any way. Um, but then this happened. Um, I was doing an album cover for Matt, Matt Sharp again, my cellist friend. Uh, he's got this band ZRI. I was going to do an album cover. I didn't really have a firm idea of what it was. Vague, possible idea. So I typed eight words into Mid Journey, and that came out. And I like it. Uh, it looks like my work. So I used it. Um, and I ran to my neighbour. My neighbour happens to have done a master's degree in artificial intelligence. Um, and I said, look at this thing that it did. And she said, well, what it's probably done is it's gone off into the internet and it's found your name. And uh, that's why it looks a bit like some of your work. And I said, well, I don't think so, because I didn't use my name in the prompt. I mean, it doesn't know who I am. I just wrote some very bland words in that I thought might put it in a certain, certain kind of image. But I didn't use my name at all. And she said, well, it probably knows your IP address. I thought, oh, <laughs> Jesus, really? Is that a thing? So completely paranoid about this, I decided I could either just quit in my fetal position, I'd just pack it in, I'd retrain as a beekeeper or something, or I could respond. So I re responded with this. Because the subject matter and what, what it was, the, the implications of it, was just filling my head. I couldn't think of anything else. So um, that's a couple more of those things. Uh, so this is the book. Um, I've been working on uh, a possible project with a, an amazing writer called Robert McFarlane, and it involves the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the oldest known human story. So I thought, what I, what I need to do, I think, is set up a couple of exercises where I can, I can get the AI to do it, whatever it does, and uh, I can observe it, and I can see where its strengths are and where its weaknesses are, 
and give it a road test, really, and also use that as a way of explaining to my audience for the book what it is, what on earth is going on. So um, what I decided to do was feed in trans the, our most current translate translation, line by line, of the, the key chapter from Gilgamesh into the AI. Just fed those lines in one at a time. Um, and I didn't want to print what that text was. I wanted to see if anything of the story would survive from 4,000 years in the past through, because it was written in cuneiform on stone tablets, this extraordinarily dense and hard to translate visual language. Um, visual writing form, I should say, it's not a language. Um, through the centuries, and then out into the ether of AI land, whatever, you know, whatever it's scraping off the floor of the internet to try and turn it back into a visual language. Would anything of the story survive that weird conversation? So, I've now, it's, so I got this back. And so it's pretty impenetrable, much like the Cunean Four tablets. But if you just go through the book and start to sort of say what you see, really, I've been surprised at how much, how many of the points of the story survive. And uh, a couple of, my wife was the first unlucky uh, guinea pig I tried this on. And she didn't know Gilgamesh at all, but she got a lot of the story marks. That's the violent bit. The second exercise was I wanted to see how AI sees us. So I thought I would feed in one headline from my newspaper of choice every day for a month. Uh, and I got back this strange alternate version of our world. Um, and halfway through this process, one of the headlines happened to be uh, a Google engineer was sent home because he reckoned his chatbot had become sentient. It's perfect, that's, that's it, that's my theme. So that became the centre point and I tracked that story back and forward to give the illusion of structure, as Stuart Lee would say. Um, and then all kinds of strange images came out of this, including Robert, jo uh, this is Boris Johnson's food policy <laughs> on a plate. Uh, this is one of our ex-prime ministers. I forget how many we've had since Boris Johnson was around. Um, this was the strangest one for me. This was a headline about the Labour Party in England becoming the new party of um, pro-English uh, patriotism, of uh, pro-English feelings. And look what it's done. It's found the red of the Union Jack. And the Labour Party has a red flag. And it's wrapped up these figures in the red flag. You know that expression, being wrapped in the flag? Do you know that expression? Being overly patriotic. It's like an AI joke or something. <laughs> um, and then uh, this was the only image that I censored, I didn't use in the book. Uh, so this was a headline about the massacre in Texas. And all it could draw on, clearly, was the photojournalism of grieving parents and children outside the school. So there's no way I could conscience using that just for my, ex my exercise about AI. So I didn't use that. But what I took from that is that AI has no feelings to hurt, doesn't care about hurting our feelings. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, the final chapter in the book is, oh, my, I go for a walk every day. How are we doing for time? Yeah, it's all right. Um, I go for a walk every day to think my problems out. Uh, and I took the subject of AI out with me on one of my walks. And I took a recorder. And I just wandered around and tried to get all of these thoughts into one cohesive bunch of questions. Um, and I took photographs, I always take photographs of the birds and the, where I'm walking around. So I did that as well. I tried not to look too mad, mumbling away to myself. Uh, and I brought back my questions and I got the AI to render answers to those questions. And then I took all my pictures of the birds and the walk and all the images that have been rendered and I re-rendered all of them again uh, through a different AI system that sampled the texture from my paintings. So everything started to look like my work. 
I, I, and lost the, uh, the difference between reality and fantasy, which is exactly how it was my state of mind at the time. That's how I was feeling. Um, anyway, so that's how that one came out. And I tried to reach some sort of conclusions. I'm still working on those conclusions. But the dark side of it, the, 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 the ethical black holes are obviously really pressing. Where are these images coming from? Um, what is the nature now of art and creativity if all that is happening is somebody's tapping away random words? Never has the gap between the lack of effort of any kind going in and the sophistication of the results coming out been so far apart. And where do I fit into this? Where do any of us fit into this anymore? And is this the future we want, really? So I had lots of questions. I've continued to try and work with AI. It's not going anywhere. And fold it into my work and try and reach an accommodation with it where I feel I'm using it rather than it using me. But I'm, it's a bit of a sugar rush, really. So it does get to the point where you feel a bit sated, a bit sick. So I'm using it very little now. Um, oh, I put this in because to show you how kind of ambivalent I feel about this now. I was doing an album cover for another friend and I rendered this. It's actually a comp of about 10 different renders, but in total it took me about an hour rendering and compositing and sent it off. And they wrote back and said, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all right, but it's a bit fantasy for us. And I agree, it is. So, but if I'd have painted that, that would have been two weeks' work. I'd have been furious. Um, but I just rendered another one in about 10 minutes. I'm really ambivalent about it. This is really awful. <laughs> Um, but, so I'm, you know, I'm struggling here to, 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 to deal with this. Now, to end my little chat with you all, um, in, the, in the paperback version of this, I wrote a sort of afterward. Bearing in mind, I'd, I've now talked to lots of people about it and done podcasts and interviews and journalists and various things. And again, trying to work out where I am with this. So I'm, actually, I'm just going to read this little afterward to you as we uh, took to end up. Who is that woman over there? The soulless gaze through button eyes, the putty white smoked skin and the raven hair, the cleft lip and vaguely Asian attire. I took part in a discussion at the Arnold Feeney in Bristol about AI and its impact on the creative world. I took along some pre and post AI work to show, as I've just done, and uh, I thought I'd begin with a provocative prompt to throw up on the screen as the audience arrived. The death of art. All the images AI generated in response to that statement or question featured this woman usually in close-up, staring back at me, impassive. I wondered if there was a well-known band or theatre group or something called the Death of Art that would prompt such a specific and persistent response. A quick Google coughed up nothing along those lines. She remained a question marker. After the talk, a lady in the signing queue told me she is embedded in the algorithm, and it's either her or a nebulous figure with its back to us in a non-committal landscape that are the defaults for dealing with questions too high concept for the bot to scrape anything more particular off the floor of the internet. I still wonder who she is and why the slight deformations. This all feels like we're helping one of the coders deal with some deeply repressed psychological trauma. But this is already old news. More recent iterations of the software have abandoned her. The death of art now gets more allegorical responses. In fact, everything now looks much more slick and finished than the strangely morphed bacon and clay world of deformed unreality that I summoned in the creation of this book back in mid-22. Now you get this. I wonder if this is machine learning in action or whether the coding is being changed and therefore we are given an insight into how much we are going to be reliant on slaves to, the coders, and their, for want of a better word, taste. 
I've now taken part in a barrage of online conversations, podcasts and discussions and watched as bewildered journalists try to work out what the hell's going on and why we should care. I'm very happy that so many people do care about the cordyceps that has started sprouting out of our collective creative consciousness. The main issues remain as they were when I first became aware of the technology and despite much heated discussion in the press on current affairs shows and burning down the below the line comments sections of antisocial media, nothing much has been added to the debate. It remains a powerful tool for generating curious and surprising stuff and that stuff when curated by interesting prompters like my friends Mario Cavalli and Ryan Hughes, for example, can be genuinely engaging. It can be used as raw material for further collage or physical media work and can therefore be part of the creative process. And the downsides. Exactly where are the algorithms being, what are the algorithms being trained on? Clearly everything, which means a vast amount, no, all, the copyrighted work that has been uploaded to the web in simpler times, but which is still owned by its original creators. The sheer audacity of the moral vacuum that is the creator of Midjourney concerning their data set. There isn't really a way to get 100 million images and know where they're coming from. Is enough for any formal hearing, isn't it? If we'd only killed a few people, obviously that would be murder. But we've killed so many people now, we can't possibly know who they all are. So it's just not worth the court's time. The court cases are beginning, and good luck to Sarah Anderson, Kelly McKernan, and Carla Ortiz, because even though I don't think there's any chance of returning any or many of the contents to Pandora's box, I do think the total lack of any forethought on the part of the radical tech fundamentalists has to be called out. The argument that it is just a tool remains hopelessly naive. It is a tool, but not just a tool. We are racing to keep up with the implications of how it will change society. The idea that it dem democratises creativity is also utterly bogus. Creativity is already completely democratic. Anyone can pick up a pencil, write or draw something, sing a song. You don't need special membership of a club. These things are open to all. Just get on with it and enjoy the doing of it. I've been contacted several times about non-fungible tokens, another contemporary digital phenomenon that sounds to me like selling bottles of air. But it, is in, it, but it is possible, but, sorry, but if it is possible to blockchain an image to prove its ownership, no matter what turbulence happens to it online, then it must be possible to watermark AI activity, to at least prove beyond doubt and conspiracy theorists that the photorealistic image of a beloved television news anchor in sexual congress with a koala, koala bear is fiction. Or that photo of Elvis being abducted by greys, or... Ukrainian soldiers wearing swastikas. Whatever depravity some human mind wants to conjure is fiction. The Midjourney founder interviewed by Forbes opined, it would be cool if the images had metadata embedded in them about the copyright holder, but that's not a thing. Well, you made it. It's only not a thing because you failed to make it a thing. There have been some frantically drawn lines in the sand in the illustration annual sector with many, including the Society of Illustrators, American Illustration, Communication Arts, AIGA, a most hilariously ironic spectrum, all refusing to accept AI images. Sometimes this feels to me like shouting traitor at the 1965 Newport Folk Festival, but of course, it had to happen. Policing it, however, is a whole other kettle of pixelated fish. I was particularly proud of the Art of Dave McKean, I didn't set this up, Facebook community, when, after the first few AI posts arrived, prompted using my name, I think assuming I'd be honoured by that, administrator Kevin Guthrie asked for the group's opinion on whether to accept AI stuff on the page and was met with a pretty much unanimous no. I'm glad the overwhelming majority felt that the difference was important. Most com commenters said it should be somewhere else, maybe way over there in a box. We could call it Pandora. I spent an afternoon with writer and professor at Cambridge University, Robert McFarlane, uh, just as he had been forced to get to grips with chat GPT essay writing AI, now available together with 12 or so alternatives for the discerning lazy wastrel on the interweb. This is, this is us plotting a book on, written down on pieces of card on the floor, not a computer in sight. 
They crank out C or D grade passes while the prompter catches up on a few more hours sleep. Not great essays, but still passes. Programmers issued a half-hearted attempt at a filter that spots AI activity, with a caveat that it wasn't very good. It's an arms race. AI trained on AI writing to spot and tag AI writing. Insanity. I very much hope this and the final little comic strip in this book uh, will be my last words on this tedious issue, although I doubt it will be as AI becomes ubiquitous. I'm booked to chatbot with Ian Sinclair in March, that happened, uh, of this year to mull the subject. With Ian's mind engaged, I dread to think of the Balladian dystopia in which we'll find ourselves. I have no doubt some bright spark will decide to train their pet AI on Ian's prose style, which is almost tailor-made to mimic, releasing endless rivers of C and D grade Sinclair psychogeographic liminal meanderings. All of the surface tension, none of the depth. In the meantime, I will continue to use AI as a means to a thoroughly integrated and reworked end on occasion, but mostly I'll be creating 100% AI free work with a 100% AI-free kite mark applied, and I'll continue to hope that means something. And I don't, this is rather a depressing end. I don't want to end on a depressing end, so uh, this is a drawing of a hedgehog in a paper plane. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk <laughs> and your insights into your journey into AI. Um, we have quite some time for questions. So if there are already questions from the audience, I'm happy to hand you over the microphone. It's been a long day. If we all just want to go to the bar, that's fine with me. <laughs> There's one question over there. Uh, thanks for the terrifying talk. <laughs> um, My pleasure. I've got to say, I'm a bit disappointed in myself uh, that I only know a very few of your works, so uh, it's very good. Perfectly I love understood. asking questions at FMX, but you give me so much to think about. I have no question right now, just saying thank you and we'll process. Pleasure, pleasure. Yes, there are more questions. I don't know who, who's going first. All right. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. I had so much fun to listen to you. Good, I'm glad. Uh, my question, um, do you get a lot of critique uh, from other artists that when, when you're using AI that you're not a real artist anymore? Um, you know, I, I hope it's come across that I'm very much a critic of this but a critic who wants to understand it. You know, I don't just want to bury my head in the sand and pretend it'll go away. It's not going to go away. Um, and so I want, and, and also I just, I couldn't let it go away. I, you know, I really, it re absolutely was filling my head uh, to, to the exclusion of everything else. And I just couldn't get on with my life until I kind of dealt with it in some way. So I feel the sugar rush an analogy is a good one. I feel like I've eaten you know, a year's worth of donuts, and I'm done. I don't need to eat any more donuts. Um, and um, I, I've also been tried to be honest about it. The reason why it's fascinating, it's a bauble, is because it is kind of extraordinary. I mean, the, the images that it coughs up are genuinely surprising. And surprise is a big part of creativity. It's a big part of what we, what we hope to get in our own work. So I can't pretend that it's not that. Um, but the ethical sides of it are so glaring. Um, it's important to have these conversations. I, I did the book as an individual, not unaffiliated with any corporation or industry, uh, to just start having that conversation. And, that conver and uh, lots of people having co conversation about the ethics and focusing on the legal side, and that's all obviously important. 
I've been focusing on the pure definitions of things. What does art mean now? What, what does creativity mean now? For me, creativity is, a, is the journey. It's not, the, it's not just an endless series of end results. It's the process of, of doing it. And I use going for a walk in my book, the analogy, deliberately. Um, the AI equivalent of going for a walk is just to teleport to the final destination. Well, that's not a walk, is it? That gives you nothing of what you want to go on a walk for. It doesn't get blood pumping or air in your lungs, or it doesn't get you, allow you to try a path that you wouldn't have come across if you hadn't have gone on that walk or that journey. That's creativity. That's where the art is for me. Um, and so I refuse to even acknowledge it as art. I don't call it AI art. It's AI stuff. It, it, it's a great generator of stuff, an endless plane of stuff. Um, but that's not what I... Under, it doesn't meet the defini working definition of art and creativity for me. So I've been focused on that. Um, and so, sure, I, I, you know, I, I think mostly because I actually used uh, a couple of the pieces in jobs. During, during those two intensive weeks, I happened to be doing those two album covers, and I used them for that. I used them partly because I liked them. I, I, I can't deny it. I, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by the results, and they looked like my work. I used them to sh uh, 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 as kind of proof, for my, uh, like a little voice on my, uh, of conscience on my shoulder to show me how easily I'm going to be out of work soon, <laughs> uh, if this continues. Um, and I, um, you know, I, I, did them, I did them also as a kind of marker in time. This was the moment, this was the week when the world changed, from, from my perspective. Um, and I don't need to do that again, that, that, that was that week. And so I'm happy not uh, going back and using AI purely straight out of the machine anymore. But as, a, as I said, as a generator of stuff, it's still fascinating. I'm doing a book at the moment, which is um, it's a version of Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. And so it's a series of dream cities. So I've been getting the AI to render dream cities along the lines of following the descriptions of Italo Calvino's text. And it's just giving me raw material. And from that raw material, I've been cutting and pasting collages and then drawing it. So the final images are my drawings. But much as I would go out and shoot photographs of reference or look through artists' books or look, you know, it's generating stuff that is surprising for me. And uh, so I'm, I feel like I'm folding it into a process whereby I'm using it, not it using me. Sorry, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Thank you for the talk. Oh. Uh, yep. And my question, yep. do you have a magic number uh, for re-rolls you allow yourself to do uh, before saying that's enough, uh, uh, it starts to be gamble? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the beginning of that. Uh, do you have a magic number for how many re-rolls uh, you do in mid-journey, for example? Uh, a magic number? Yeah, no, there's no magic involved with mid-journey. It's boring and tedious and it's bu pure bureaucracy. Um, no, I don't. I mean, I, you know... I, I, I just, I don't, I, I don't want to spend my life tapping away on a keyboard. This is so boring. I like making things and getting my hands dirty. So I'll play with it until I'm bored with it, which is 10 minutes. Next. Hi, just over, from over back here, if you don't mind. Hello. Um, hi, hi, Dave. Thank you for coming here to tell us about your experience with AI from the perspective of an artist. My name is Jan Pinkava. I'm the new uh, head of the Animation Institute and the Film Academy in Baden-Württemberg. And I'd like to invite you to come and talk with us about... Uh, really? I haven't put you off completely? Not at all. Uh, <laughs> I would like you to, to invite you to come and talk with us to uh, help us consider how we, as an educational institution, uh, approach this, this world. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in the context of being an art school and uh, considering ourselves helping uh, artists develop, it's an important question. So please, come and talk I, with us. I'd be happy to come and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the invite. I'd be delighted to do that. But, you know, I've, since, this, 
since the world changed, um, I've done a couple of talks at, at art schools, and uh, you know, I look at the sea of eager faces in front of me of, of uh, you know students. I, I I I barely know what to say. This this is a seismic uh, change. I've encountered a lot of anger in the room from students who are paying a lot of money in England for their education and now wondering what on earth it's going to be good for. These are big questions, and it's, it, you're right, it's important to talk about this. Hi, huge, Hi. huge fan from Sandman covers, so this is great. Mm. The, the long Thank answer. Um, I worked with artists, and they talked about that shock when cameras turned up, and that just launched the art movements. What does art mean now that there's cameras? And then hearing your, you generate images to use them so it's, it's still your work at the end. Do you think this will push another generation of, or are we all in a commoditized future where the fine will do? Um, th honestly, I have no idea. This is, <laughs> I have no idea how this is going to pan out. Um, I haven't heard any analogy that I feel really touches this. The photography one is not bad, because all technology makes a, a, a group of people redundant. I was an early adopter of Photoshop, and you know, there's all kinds of you know, darkroom technicians and topographers who were suddenly out of work with that one. Um, but, and photography is a good one, because suddenly painters who had complete uh, uh, monopoly on the representation of portraits and images suddenly had to find something else to do. And of course they did. Painting became something else. Painting became much more expressive and, and found something else to do. I, I still think this is different. I, I think this is... I'm, I, I'm going to go back to this fundamental idea of, of the nature of creativity. Um, if everybody can do everything, uh, this is a fundamentally changed vision of what creativity means. I, you know, creativity obviously is my god. I mean, it's a central tenant in my sense of myself. I also think it is in m for many of us. We don't have to be artists or writers or professionals in the area to, f to have a really strong sense that creativity is a, is very important to us. Whether it's doing the garden or cooking or anything where you set yourself a task and challenge yourself, it's the challenge that's important, and it's in the doing of it, and for it not to be easy, and to do things that surprise yourself, uh, and to find things along the way that you, you would never have discovered about yourself or about the thing that you end up doing. That process of creativity is, the, is essential to us. It's growing up, isn't it? Um, and I would hate to see that... I don't know about lost, but diminished, really. Um, so that's why I'm sort of hanging on but, but to grim death for my <laughs> own definitions of what art and creativity but are. But does that not then become the answer? That we, uh, the, again, for art schools, that we focus on the process? Mm. I, I, as, as I said, I've no idea. And, you know, photography started very simply as a technical exercise, but the art of photography also blossomed. I'm struggling to see the, the art in this. Um, and maybe that's just my problem. Maybe there will be a new generation of creators who somehow transform this um, technology into, into something else that I can't see at the moment. But as I say, one of the, going back to one of the, my first comments, the gap between the lack of any kind of effort, therefore testing of yourself, and the sophistication of the end result, and we're only six months into this. In two years' time, what the hell is it going to do? You'll, walk up, you'll, get, you'll get home and say, I want to see a film about this, this, and this. A blue man walks into a big castle, and uh, there's a dragon. And you'll watch a three-hour Disney spectacular about that. It will custom-make your film for you. Really? Do, really? Is that what we want? I don't know, maybe we do. Maybe there's lots of people here, so that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so much of, of what I value in storytelling is lost at that point, disappears at that point. Storytelling for me is 
abdicating my control to a great master storyteller and, and, and receiving that great story and then living with it and at different parts in my life it will mean different things and, I, and, and it will be folded into my personal sense of self. The, the great books that I've read, I hold them inside me still. This is what makes us and this is how we pass the culture and our sense of ourselves to each other. It's not sitting isolated at home watching a fucking dragon and a blue man in a castle. Stop being so angry. <laughs> right. Are we done? Any more? I think there was. Any more? Question? I can't get any angrier than this. Oh, uh, maybe you can. Uh, what I wanted to know is... <laughs> A challenge, uh, that's what we like. Uh, did you ever look at the data sets um, that I used to train the AI and uh, look for your name and see what images you've created are used to train the AI? Or did you ever use one of the tools where the uh, uh, image you created uh, can be decomposed and you see what the source images are? It turns out you're right. I can get angrier than this. <laughs> um, I, yes, I did you go to the website, uh, have you been scraped recently or whatever the hell it's called. And yes, I did see the vast amount of images of mine that are, on, uh, that are part of a data set somewhere. Um, it's, you know... It's pretty miserable. I mean, there are lots of uh, people trying to um, take these people to court, trying to get some sort of opt-out, trying to get some sort of royalties paid whenever your name is coughed up. Um, I honestly don't hold out much hope that things are going to change. You just have to look at the example of social media, anti-social media, I tend to call it. Uh, we all know what the problems are. If you uncouple freedom of speech from personal responsibility, you get that mess. Um, we know what the problems are. Is there any political will to change that? No. Is there any will within the companies to put ethical, safe guardrails in place? No. So I don't think anything will change there. It's down to us again to form our own ethical boundaries for dealing with this stuff. You know, putting a prompt in to Mid Journey using another artist's name, as far as I'm concerned, is obviously wrong. I've never done it, and I hope. I hope none of you have either. Um, and, uh, but, but I know that as the, just because I'm not using another artist's name directly, other artist's work is being trawled. The, str the, the strange grey area of it, obviously, is that it's not cutting and pasting anything. It's not directly copying anything. It's learning from it. So what is the difference between that and looking at a book of artists' work and learning from that book and trying to draw like them. There's a strange grey area of awkward conversation there. But what was the question? Yes, I have is the answer to your question. And yes, <laughs> blo bloody depressing it was as well. Any last remnants of questions? Yeah, there, there is. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. This is it. This is the one. This is going to be the one that's going to contextualise everything we've witnessed this afternoon. Make it a good one. Can you decide? No pressure. Maybe we have time for two. So please, please. No, because one thing is about, you know, we are like about copyright of uh, artists who, whose work gets duplicated. But I think the really scary thing is about, you know, thinking about kids saying to, into their mobile some words, instead of scribbling on the floor, instead of doing drawings when they're small, they take the mobile and they just say a few words and then they get a drawing out of it. And this one replacing kids actually drawing, or at school, instead of writing, a, writing an essay, they just say the keywords in their program and then they get the whole essay out of it. And they will never write an essay again. I think this would change humanity. Um, yes, I think I, that, that's what I've been saying for the last half hour. Uh, that's where we're heading. That's the future. Do you want that future? Um, you know, art, the, my working definition of art is, it's an, I used it in Black Dog, is an empathy machine. Um, when you make something, I get to experience the world through your eyes, through your imagination, through your lived life. And if, and if I, I'm doing the same, I hope I can... That's what I aspire to, really, to transfer some of those 
ideas across. We can look through each other's eyes. All of that is missing from this AI experience. That would be a loss, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be a terrible loss? So for children growing up and, and testing themselves, you know, I've had kids, they always look for shortcuts, but this is, you know, they're, they're, you're only fooling yourself, really. Uh, learning a musical instrument is hard. If you could just say violin and suddenly you can play the violin, you learn nothing. Uh, the kids who are writing, kids, students who are writing um, essays for Robert McFarlane in Cambridge University, getting C and D grade passes, are only fooling themselves, really. They haven't learned anything. Um, it's the learning, it's not the C and D grade pass that's important at the end of the day. I've, I, I got my, I went to art school, I got a piece of paper, I've never needed it, I've never referred to it. It was the experience of going and learning and testing myself and being challenged there. That's the important thing. Wow. Well, thanks very much for listening to my uh, anger, and my blather. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. If anybody wants to read further.